Hello everyone, I'm Chester44, also known as Fly, and welcome to this Let's Play of In Other Waters. Last episode, we made our way over to this uh, garden that's located over here, because we managed to get something that allowed us to push ourselves further across uh, currents and the like. And we found this garden that has a lot of species that we need to look at. So we're going to do just that. We have much to look at. Don't you worry. Okay. First thing first. Everything except these two is going into the sample storage. We'll analyze it later. First up, we have Setaphora, bristle carriers, gardener. Gardeners are feathery, slow-moving creatures that live among the pillar garden flora. Their upper part is mainly composed of densely packed fern-like arms. Underneath is a body resting on a dense profusion of short root-like legs that anchor the gardener but also enable it to walk, albeit very slowly. As gardeners move, they also rhythmically wave their arms, though it is unclear if this is for balance or is part of their pruning action within the petal gardens they inhabit. Gardeners don't do anything fast, but they do travel between pillars using the silken tendrils that grow between them. More analysis is needed to discern why and what their relationship to these gardens really is. Feather sample, arm sample. And then we have sec under section, t section Tinea, the pillar worm. Pillar worms are long, thin, segmented creatures that live deep in the dark tunnels and recesses of the rock pillars found in the East Reef. They are frustratingly difficult to observe properly, due both to their shyness and their surprisingly rapid swimming speed. They can, however, be startled out of their burrows by consistent tapping on the rock. Once glimpsed, it's evident that they have stri stri the striations that taper to a bright, lure-like tail. Their front half is protected with overlapping rigid plates. They also seem to be burrowing or excavating creatures, ejecting dust and sediment periodically from their burrows. Further analysis is required to determine why they live so reclusively within the pillars. Plate sample, tail sample. I think we have those. And the sea silk. This bright green plant stretches its silken tendrils in long horizontal swaths between pillars in the East Reef. This plant is characterized by its fibrous, fine, and flexible strands that can be as thick as rope and as thin as human hair, appearing almost white in sunlight. How they form their bridges and why the plant's tendrils do not rise to the surface is unclear. I've observed one plant intertwined with strands from other pillars, and when these multiple strands meet, often in areas roughly equidistant from their respective pillars, they seem to form a web. I wonder if strands from individual plants are drawn to one another. For that, we need strands sample, root sample. Okay. Fortunately, we have a ton of samples. So let's go through them all. Chitin plate. We've got pillar worm taxonomy. Silken strands. Sea silk taxonomy. Shed tail, pillar worm. Silken root, sea silk. Petal shoot, shimmer blooms, and feather arm. Gardener. Okay. The gardener, we've only got a theory, but we don't have the behavior. We missed a feather sample. Analysis of the gardener's arm filled with pinules has shed some light on the relationship between them and the pillar gardens. The debris coating the sample is actually pollen from various garden species, suggesting that gardeners are an important part of the cross-pollination process. This means their contribution to the ecosystem is not just limited to pruning the blooms, they help propagate them too. Indeed, given their roaming paths from pillar to pillar, they must have some way of communicating and ensuring that no one garden becomes wilted or overgrown. This could be a huge social hive structure or a territorial signature they leave behind. Either way, they're a well-coordinated team of marine landscape gardeners. Okay, we need to find a feather sample from them back in the garden, which we'll do. Pillar worm, behavior. Analysis of a pillar worm's chitinous plate shows a creature heavily adapted to its burrowing lifestyle. 
It seems that the chitinous plates found around the organism's head are precisely grooved, allowing the worm to chip away at existing recesses to create tunnels and funneling the sediment back towards the surface. These grooves should also help protect the creature's head from abrasions while traveling the burrows. It's logical then that these bugs create the tunnels that other life, especially the silken tendrils and the petal gardens, require. They must be one of the foundations of this unique ecosystem, turning the hard rock pillars into vertical gardens through their obsessive burrowing. Dissection of the pillar worm's tail has shed light on their hunting and feeding behaviors. The tail itself is made from many panels of bright translucent chitin. Given the tail's brightness and the way it waves in the current, it's reasonable to conclude that the worm is using it as a lure. It could be an effective tool for the worm to attract small grazers to a tunnel's mouth with before pouncing it from the burrow and pulling its prey into the hole with it. Into the hole with it. However, the tail might serve fu another function too, as a countermeasure against predators. Was this specimen bitten off or willingly ejected? Either way, the pillar worm remains good at hiding its secrets within those dark burrows. And here we have the, ske the sketch. Group shell segments, swimming fins, feeding mandible, tunneling limbs, oak leaf markings. Interesting. Shimmer blooms. Analysis of a shimmer bloom shoot has revealed a coiled stalk which each shimmer bloom possesses, allowing them to control their height in the water. This means that if a shimmer bloom grows beyond the optimum depth for, depth for photosynthesis, it is able to extend its stalk and rise in the water towards the surface. However, due to the constant sunlight, which is an effect of Glia's 667C's tidally locked orbit, shimmer blooms also use this ability to retract themselves away from the sun in order to protect themselves from cell damage. These beautiful plants are highly attuned to their environment, and I can think of no better species to give Manet's name to. It is a name that deserves to live on in this place. I'm sorry I can't do more. Recessed stamens, extensive stalk, pro pollen producing stamen, and photosynthetic cells. Okay. And the sea silk. Analysis of a strand of sea silk has shown that it is in fact from two different plants that have somehow conjoined where they met. Moreover, there are younger growths formed near to the end of each plant's strand, demonstrating their ability to form new shoots along their length, which must be why I've observed a web-like pattern in some of the tangles. However, new growths require a good deal of energy. The strands are green on one side, a sign of photosynthesis no doubt, but their underside is distinctly darker and more porous looking. Are the strands able to absorb matter floating up from underneath them? I need to analyze a root structure or similar to find out more. But we have one. I was surprised to discover that the seek silk does not end in roots. After finding a damaged strand, I found it emanating from a kind of silken ball that I initially took to be a root. However, in lab analysis, it was revealed to be an entirely separate creature. The sea silk is a product or plant-like limb of this organism. I discovered the root itself to be able to put down, but also retract strands of sea silk from within. It's an unusual fusion of creatures. Is this a symbiotic relation or a parasitic one? Regardless, these, cre these curious creatures and their growths are the bridge builders of the pillar ecosystem, turning isolated gardens into a connected network and helping them flourish. Okay, that's the root creature. That's very interesting. Okay, so in order to finish, we need to find a feather sample of the gardener. Which I'm fairly certain... Ah! Ah! Pillar sees a lot of traffic from passing gardeners. It would be a good place to find one of their strange feathers. Okay, we can find one of them easily enough. Then we're going to go and gather up the other things. But yes, first things first, I'm just stupid and missed out on what I was supposed to gather. So there must have been one on the big one over here. And we need to fill that with oxygen and initiate boost. That must have been it over here. Creature tracks. Yep, this was it. We got it. Shed feather. All right, let's bring this one quickly back.
I apologize for missing that. It was the one thing that I didn't actually go to. Clearly, I am an idiot. To the lab. Analyze the feather. There we go. Analysis of a gardener's feather, which I have called a pinule, has revealed the gardener's feet on the same thing they camouflage themselves as, the garden's petals. The gardener feather pinules have a razor-like edge, which the gardener cuts away thin sections of petal to feed on, without damaging the plant. However, unlike an actual feather, they contain nerves, suggesting the gardener can deliberately control them for precise pruning and for maneuvering in the water if they become dislodged from a tendril bridge. Quite why they risk such journeys in their ineffective swimming remains to be seen, Further study may unlock the puzzle of their purpose within the biome, which we already know. We gave a read to that. Oh, wow. This being the animal, it looks like a plant, which gives it very good camouflage, I have to admit. Okay. With that handled, it's time for us to go to the next area, which is down here. For that, we need to head south. Because I do remember there was something down there we need to get to. We needed uh, this in order to reach. But we can't because we need... Right. Alright, I'm just going to do this so that we can travel a bit faster. Fortunately, I do remember that there are some of the things that we need over in this direction. There it is. This will give us what we need. A couple of shrill saps. There we go. Okay, we can re refill on power and oxygen here. I think I might be, I think I can get to it through this way. Perfect. It's right over here that we need to get to. And we may as well gather up a few more of these. Perfect. Okay, it was a big roundabout route, wasn't it? Annoying, but we don't really have much option. The only way we can get there. But we'll get what we need. Oh no, maybe it was over here. Yes, it was probably over there. Yes! All right, activate. The central rift is deep and wide and the current running down it is relentless. Spores and other particles leave greasy streaks on the faceplate of my helmet as they hammer into it. 
suit creaks as I lean into the flow, and the unbroken walls ahead suggest nothing worth risking my life for. This mushroom-shaped stalk cowers beside the rift. Its cap broken, and segments of it sit in the sand. I could sample one here. This is the sample we needed. Got it! Cap section. Perfect. Send us back, please. Alright, thank you very much. Okay, back to the lab. Let's analyze it and see what we got. Reef caps. What do you have to say about them? Analysis of reef cap tissue show that the reef caps maintain a bacterial symbiont within a series of internal chambers, which, while unique to Glias 667cc, resembles Epulopiscium, a large cell bacteria found in the stomachs of terrestrial surgeonfish. Epulopiscium helps surgeonfish break down algae effectively, and the reef caps bacteria seems to do the same, with traces of algae-like growths found in the, with the cap chambers. Where's this algae coming from? However the caps receive it, this algae is allowing the caps to grow bacterial colonies, which then reduce themselves to endospores when the algae is digested. These endospores are then released to the stalks in the local area to renew the strength of their colonies. It's an incredible recycling system for protecting this ecosystem. This looks like the ones that explode except more healthy. Interesting. All right, on to the docking bay. We're gonna be heading over to here next. And for that, I think we can actually push our way across. Okay, heading this way. It's over on this side, that's where we need to get to. Alright, activate the boost. Here, a rift meets the exposed rift edge. What caused this huge slash into the shelf? Surely not just erosion. Across the channel is a gap in the rock wall. If strong currents rushing down the rift can be navigated, we can cross here. The western shelf is buffeted by currents, bringing with them a scattering of swirling spores. broken shelf of the reef reaches out towards the deep like a hand. This is the first of three fingers which mark the edge. My reading means we don't move as fast through here as I'd hoped. That is a dead end. A shattered section of the wall allows passage into the outcrop. These huge stones have been worn smooth by thousands of years of sitting beside the rift. This section of the shelf, sheltered by the tall headland to the north, is strangely peaceful. Beyond these thickly entwined stalks, a violent current can be heard, rushing down through a gap in the headland. We'll come to that in a bit. Maybe we'll find a source of, uh, the bubbles down here. White sand is gathered against the boulders on either side of this passage in soft, pale drifts. Uh, this tall stalk is torn open, perhaps by a predator? Inside, a rich tapestry of fungal life forms exposed to the open water are slowly dying. Ah, good. Sing stalk.
Fortunately, we still have a few of those, and we have Fungal Cluster, a cluster of creatures sampled from the interior of a stalk. The other one should be up here. Well, fortunately, we have some of these. Oh, right. I need to uh, activate the boost. The water is funneled by the rocks into this clearing, making it hard going against the rush. A large boulder protects the mouth of this passage from the onrushing waters. Battered by the water, these stalks cling to the rocks. A single creature braves the current to graze on their twisted forms. And attached to the side of the shelf, this canopy is partially bent by the current. If we are careful, we can retrieve a sample from its top. Perfect. Just what we needed. So we're stuck here, but we have what we came for. Canopy growth. All right, teleport back, please. Let's get these identified. Oh, no, wait. Uh, sample store. Boom. 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 Perfect. To the lab. Analyze the fungal cluster. And analyze the canopy growth. First, the sing stalk. Attempts to analyze the interior of a sing stalk reveals many different organisms within the stalk which are not genetically related to it in any way. It seems that the sing stalks are actually tubular gardens, which host juvenile fungal creatures. The swaying of the stalks keeps these sealed environments fed with filtered water and microbial life, while allowing their spores to be distributed across the reef. However, I haven't found a single example of any of these life forms growing outside of a sing stalk suggesting that they can only survive within these carefully controlled tube gardens, and that the spores they release are being used by the stalks for other purposes. Are these vertical farms designed to cultivate other species that might feed the rest of the stalks with showers of nutrient-rich spores? Spore release, fungal symbiotes, singing chitin plates, internal fungal colony, young sing stalk, typical reef stalk. Okay. And then we have the table stalk. Laboratory studies of the growths found in the upper canopy reveals that they contain the genetic material of tens of different species. These growths hold, within their round casing, seeds for many species local to the table stalks, as well as spores for the reproduction of the stalk colonies themselves. Fed by a carefully maintained flow of the correct minerals and chemicals, these seeds and spores are preserved by the stalks, kept viable for long periods. Could these seed banks be a complex example of collective ser serotony? On Earth, some plants hold viable seeds until an environmental trigger, such as wildfire or disease, causes their release. Perhaps the stalks are preserving the local ecology in case of environmental disaster. Are they the guardians of this reef? Very impressive. Alright. That appears to be everything. I don't think you have anything, do you? No. All right. Well, with that, it seems we've explored everything there is here. While it does point at something being out here, I don't think we're going to explore there because that may be something else that we're not going to deal with anytime soon. But it looks like our next trip is going to be going to the north. We've got a path going over this way that we need to go through. But that is going to be in the next episode because this one's gone on long enough. So, until then, I am Chesuk44, also known as Fly. This has been a Let's Play in In Other Waters, and I shall see you all next time.